I remember when I first learned about black holes. I imagined these gigantic cosmic vacuum cleaners that must eventually suck up everything. They're not really like that. I imagine wormholes to other dimensions. Also probably nonsense. And I imagined that it was just a matter of time before a black hole finally found its way to the Earth. So that part might actually happen. Proper big black holes are very, very far away. The nearest known is the Cygnus X1 black hole at a thousand light years distant. It's currently devouring its binary companion star, which is how we see it. But there's no possibility of it ever coming close enough to the Earth to cause trouble here. We know that there are plenty of these stellar mass black holes wandering the galaxy that we don't see, but the chance of one coming close enough to cause serious trouble in our solar system is tiny. However, there is one scenario which could allow for black holes to pass through our solar system and even the planet with startling frequency. In fact, it may have already happened. The early universe was a wild place. All space everywhere was a boiling particle soup. A glob of that material in the modern universe would immediately collapse into a black hole. But back then, the universe had the same insane density everywhere. Matter was smoothly spread out, with only tiny density fluctuations. And so gravity had no strongly preferred direction to collapse towards. The expanding universe then thinned out this matter to more sensible levels, and those little fluctuations in density eventually collapsed into stars and galaxies instead of black holes. Really, it was the smoothness of the early universe that saved all of matter from collapsing into black holes. But that doesn't mean that no black holes were formed. There would have been some regions that just happened to be especially dense. Countless black holes might have formed at the earliest of times while still leaving plenty of matter left for stars. We call these primordial black holes and we've talked about them before. We've also talked about these PBHs may have been created in such stupendous numbers that they account for 86% of the mass of the universe and are therefore an explanation for dark matter. Depending on when they formed, PBHs could have virtually any mass, from tiny micro black holes all the way up to the supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. Now, over the decades, astronomers and cosmologists have managed to systematically rule out most of the windows of possible masses if PBHs are to account for most of the dark matter. For example, if there were enough of these black holes, then they'd frequently pass in front of more distant stars, magnifying those stars' light with gravitational lensing. The rarity of this phenomenon, along with several other clever methods, has allowed us to pretty much rule out all masses greater than around 10 to the power of 19 kilograms, or around 15% the mass of our moon. Meanwhile, if primordial black holes had masses smaller than around a trillion kilograms, then they have all evaporated by now by leaking away their mass in Hawking radiation. This leaves a small and very contentious window of possible masses, comparable to the masses of large asteroids. Black holes this big don't devour stars like Cygnus X1, and they don't warp the passage of light from distant stars strongly enough to easily spot them. But fortunately for astronomers, and perhaps less fortunate for everyone else, if dark matter really is made of asteroid mass black holes, then there must be an absolutely insane number of them out there to account for most of the mass in the universe, which means we can wait for them to come to us. Given how much dark matter we know there is in the Milky Way, we calculate that there's probably around 10 to the power of 18 kilograms of dark matter in the solar system at any given time. If that dark matter is tiny black holes, then we might expect dozens, maybe even thousands of them to be in the solar system right now. And just like asteroids, given enough time, some of them will quite literally cross paths with the Earth. So what happens if a black hole hits the Earth? It turns out this is actually a scientifically very useful question. So let's figure it out. First, to allay your concerns, if an asteroid mass primordial black hole hit the Earth, we wouldn't be destroyed which is good, because if dark matter really is made of these things, then it's probably already happened. This PBH would be small. Its event horizon, its surface of no return, would be around the size of an atom, and it would be moving fast when it hit the Earth. 
It must have fallen in from interstellar space and so should be traveling from several tens to hundreds of kilometers per second. It would punch straight through the planet like a bullet through cotton candy, barely slowing down in the process. Let's talk specifics. We'll say our black hole has the mass of the Martian moon Phobos, 10 to the power of 16 kilograms, like a large asteroid. That gives it an event horizon the size of a hydrogen atom. At interstellar speeds, it spends around a minute passing through the Earth. Given that size and speed, our Phobos mass black hole might consume a few thousand tons, which is tiny for the Earth, and it's even tiny for that black hole. The planet barely notices the passage. But I do not recommend standing right under a falling black hole. Locally, the encounter is catastrophic, which is actually a good thing if you don't happen to be there when it happens, because it may let us detect signs of past PBH impacts. Let's talk about what happens when our black hole first enters the atmosphere. In the immediate surroundings of any black hole, gravity accelerates matter to incredible speeds. Near the event horizons, particles collide with each other at sizable fractions of the speed of light. This generates hilariously high temperatures, much hotter than the cores of a star. This is how we see black holes like Cygnus X1 or the supermassive black holes in quasars from the radiation generated by the infalling or accreting material. But there's a limit to how much radiation a black hole can produce. That same radiation causes an outward pressure that partially counters the black hole's intense gravity. Try to feed a black hole too fast and it starts to blast away its own food. The bigger the black hole, the faster it can feed. But there's a limit defined by its mass. We call this the Eddington limit. It's the maximum brightness that the material around the black hole can radiate before radiation pressure cuts off the fuel. The tiny event horizon of a micro black hole is a very narrow choke point for matter trying to flow in. Its Eddington limit is very low. For an asteroid mass black hole at the absolute top end of our mass range, the cloud of plasma is barely microns in size. However, it still shines with the power of a hundred Hiroshima's every second. If such a black hole passes into our atmosphere, it would look like the brightest shooting star you've ever seen, producing a destructive shockwave before hitting the ground and tunneling through the planet. Now, this description is not too different from the Tunguska event, a massive impact that occurred in 1908 in the middle of Siberia. Witnesses describe a stripe of light in the sky as bright as the sun, and a thunderous sound like cannons that leveled trees and broke windows over hundreds of kilometers, actually making a shockwave that traveled around the world. The fact that there was no clear crater or meteor from that impact led some physicists in the 70s to suggest that maybe this was a black hole punching through the Earth. But there was only one shockwave detected in the Earth's atmosphere and a black hole's exit on the other side should have made another. These days, the standard narrative is that the Tunguska event resulted from an asteroid or comet exploding in the atmosphere. But we can't be 100% sure. This was, after all, 1908, and if the black hole exited in the middle of the ocean, it could have been missed. Tunguska level devastation is only for black holes at the top end of our mass range. The smaller the black hole, the more likely it is we'd miss it as it passed through the atmosphere. But the passage of the black hole through the Earth itself might still be detected. This black hole bullet would generate a shockwave through the Earth's mantle like a supersonic Mach cone. These seismic waves would reach all points on the Earth's surface. Even at the lowest mass possible for a primordial black hole, it will produce the equivalent of a magnitude 4 earthquake. That's small, but definitely noticeable, and it would look very different from a regular earthquake because it would be felt across the entire Earth's surface. Problem is, no such thing has ever been detected. Now part of the trouble is that these impacts will be very rare. For the smallest PBH masses, there may only be one black hole hitting the Earth every million years. For the Phobos mass black holes or larger, you may only get one in the entire history of the Earth. The fact that we haven't seen this happen during the few years that we've had seismometers doesn't really tell us much. 
It might also be possible to detect the tiny gravitational influence of a PBH passing close to the Earth on a near miss. But even after years of gravity monitoring, none of these seems to have shown up. Okay, so spotting a live PBH seems unlikely. But what about finding signs of past impacts? Unfortunately, neither the Earth's atmosphere nor its surface would keep a good record of micro black holes hitting the Earth. Earth's dynamic interior and its eroding atmosphere would quickly erase the tiny scar of the PBH passage. But the same can't be said of the Moon. Without any real atmosphere or tectonic activity, our Moon's surface has an almost complete history of its impacts written on its surface. Telling apart craters made by black holes and those made by regular old rocks is hard, but not impossible, thanks to some new theory work. Recently, some scientists have calculated how the shape of a black hole's crater would be different from that of an asteroid. When an asteroid hits the moon, it stops very quickly, making something of a big round explosion sending matter out in all directions. This makes a crater basin at the point of contact and a gentle sloping ejector blanket around it. But when a black hole hits, it doesn't stop, it goes straight through. The pressure from the superheated plasma around it creates a shockwave that pushes outwards, creating a kind of line explosion. If the regular asteroid is like a pile of TNT being detonated on the surface, the black hole is more like a borehole filled with TNT being set off. The result is that the crater may be much deeper, while the matter ejected around the crater goes more up than out, and it falls closer to the center, making a much steeper blanket. One of the great things about this hypothesis is that it makes some very specific predictions. For one, craters come in pairs. If you have an entrance wound, you have an exit wound. Moreover, the incredible heat of the plasma around the black hole should sear the rock around it into exotic high-pressure phases of quartz and pyrite that otherwise couldn't be produced by regular asteroid impacts. And a line of that fancy quartz should point from one crater to the other, although we need to actually go back to the moon to test that part. No such crater has ever been found, but a serious search has not yet been done. Okay guys, so to wrap up, have any black holes ever hit the Earth? We don't know. We probably wouldn't have noticed if they had. Finding a single such case though would be huge. For one thing, this would inspire an entire subgenre of black hole impact science fiction horror, which is a positive outcome that should not be discounted. But the discovery would also tell us that primordial black holes are a thing, and it would tell us about their masses that could lead to figuring out the nature of dark matter and to understanding the crazy black hole spawning chaos that defined the birth of this space-time. Before we get to comments, there's a few things. First, I want to let you know about a fun new episode of Above the Noise that dives into the research and debates the merits of space tourism and billionaires in space. I know from previous episodes that many of you have strong opinions on our spacefaring future, so check out the episode, drop your thoughts into the comments, and let them know politely that Spacetime sent you. There's a link in the description. Next, as always, if you support us on Patreon, we can't thank you enough for your support. But I also want to let you know that another great way to support the show for free is by hitting the bell icon next to the subscribe button and getting notified of new releases. By getting notifications and watching new episodes when they're first released, you actually help spread the show to other Spacetime subscribers and to new viewers. So, if you're already part of the early gang, we see you and appreciate you. And if not, hit the bell icon and join the early gang to help the space-time community. Today, we're covering comments from the last two episodes, both on different ways to break general relativity. There was the one on modified Newtonian dynamics as an explanation for dark matter, and the one on fuzzballs, the stringy theory version of the black hole. Kidsbop38 is straight fire, says that it feels like we're really chasing our tail adding all of this complexity, as in, let's just add a few more fields to GR so that our theory fits the data. Well, to that, I'll let Einstein respond. It can scarcely be denied that the supreme goal of all theory is to make the irreducible basic elements as simple and as few as possible without having to surrender 
the adequate representation of a single datum of experience. And that quote is often paraphrased as, everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. Occam's razor is a guiding principle, not a rule. If the current model can't be made to fit observation, then it's missing something. In the case of general relativity, it works almost everywhere. So if we do find a place where it doesn't work, we can't just throw out the theory because there must be a reason it works everywhere else. Any new theory has to reproduce general relativity in the regimes that GR actually does work. Gareth Dean made a point that I missed in that Mond episode, and that's that we've observed galaxies that seem to be more than 99% dark matter, as well as a few galaxies that seem to lack it entirely. He asks whether the new Mond theory explains these, or does it only explain spiral galaxies? Well, given that the new Mond has trouble explaining the bullet cluster, my guess is that it also fails to explain these other anomalous galaxies. If there are any Mond researchers watching, please feel free to chime in. The first fuzzball question is from Louis Marty, who asks, what would it look like to fall into a fuzzball? And that was nicely answered elsewhere in the comments by Rob. To summarize, it would look just like falling into a regular black hole for the person falling, but it would look like you got smeared over the surface for someone watching from a distance. One of the important things about fuzzballs that we couldn't fit into the episode is the idea of complementarity. To be taken seriously, fuzzballs need to satisfy the equivalence principle. The founding idea of general relativity that says that free fall in a gravitational field is fundamentally the same as inertial motion in free space. That means that an observer falling through a black hole event horizon shouldn't notice anything special about the boundary, except the fact that they can't then reverse their motion. How does this work for a fuzzball, if it really does have a surface, that is? The proposition is that when an object hits the fuzzball surface, it sets up vibrations in that surface, and those vibrations are somehow equivalent to the object itself. As in, from the perspective of the faller, it continues to exist, coded in the complexity of the string vibrations. It's holographically projected into two spatial dimensions, and in its experience, it keeps falling. Meanwhile, from the perspective of a distant observer, it becomes a stringy pancake. This is all related to the ADS-CFT correspondence and the holographic principle which we covered previously. It says that vibrations in a quantum field on the surface of a 4D hyperbolic space are equivalent to objects inside that space. And if this sounds completely bonkers to you, then you're in good company. Thinking about it turns my brain into a fuzzball. By that I mean empty on the inside. A few of you asked how this fuzzball idea could be tested. Well, actually, this might be one of the most testable predictions of string theory. There are simulations that suggest that the gravitational waves created when fuzzballs merge should look almost exactly the same as those produced when classical black holes merge. Emphasis on the almost. It may be that the so-called ring down, the waves produced as the merged object settles back into a spheroid, lasts longer for fuzzballs than for regular black holes due to the event horizon being less cleanly defined. It's also been suggested that the Event Horizon Telescope could potentially detect deviations from general relativity in the form of quantum fluctuations near the event horizon that might be amplified by gravitational lensing. None of this has been seen yet, but upgrades to the current generation of instruments might actually have the sensitivity to spot something. We used a representation of the 4D hypersphere in the Fuzzball episode, and that was made by the talented Wildstar2002. And Wildstar actually jumped into the comments to say hi. If you want your mind blown by the best math-inspired computer graphics, including various many-dimensional geometries, I recommend you check out their channel, link in the description. Tu Bluer points out that any well-developed intuition for physics points to the correctness of the fuzzball model, on account of the fact that the connection between multidimensional cats, hairballs, and black holes can't possibly be wrong. Well, I agree that this is a compelling reason to believe in fuzzballs, which I'm going to call Schrodinger's hairballs from now on. Mr. Green, aka Aguki00, however, points out that there's really nothing special in this hypothesis because all cats are multidimensional. 
And I'll add that all animals are technically multidimensional, at least 3 plus 1 in my experience. And for that matter, all hairballs are technically quantum. Well, this teaches us one important lesson. Next time you clean up after your cat, try not to get holographically projected down into a fuzzy smear. And don't say you never learned anything on this show.